Welcome back, friends and DGens. I went to Ohio for my first poker tournament of the year, the MSPT Cleveland main event, and it was an insane experience. The streets were active, the casino was festive, and that continental breakfast was nearly edible. <laughs> But when I arrived, I stumbled across a dark and shameful secret that nearly derailed my entire weekend. Oh my god, bro. What I saw was so unexpected, so vile, and so wretched that it surely scarred me for life. In fact, it's so awful that YouTube will ban my video if I show it in the first 60 seconds. So stick around after the intro and I'll tell you all about it. And use the chapters if you just want to skip right to it. I'm Mike Reardon, part-time poker pro, and this is episode 12, MSPT main event. Bright lights, dark secrets. And now, a brief word from old man Chong. I have the second task from the Silent Aces Society. Congratulations on your new kitchen countertop. We have marked your first task as complete. Here's task number two. Travel out of state to play, but you have to win. Good luck. I like this way more than that stupid first task to change the kitchen counter. Gamble Gamble weekends with the boys are a blast, and Detroit poker has been wrecking me lately. I missed both boards. That mother Tim scoops. $3,000 pot. Yeah, come on, kid. But where to go? I considered the Horseshoe Hammond and the Reserve in Toledo before I finally decided on the Jack in Cleveland because they were hosting the MSPT $1,100 main event this upcoming weekend. But I had a problem. I could not convince any of my Detroit poker bros to join me. So why is that a problem? Well, last year I bought a new Nissan Leaf, which is the cheapest electric vehicle that still qualifies for the $7,500 tax credit under the Inflation Reduction Act. And listen, I love this car, but I was cheap and I bought the 40 kilowatt hour battery instead of the 60 kilowatt hour battery because I wanted to save 10 grand so the leaf only has 150 mile range i didn't want the headache of finding ev charging stations along the way i'd have to download an app and look up the route it's just too much work so that's why i had to trick some idiot into driving me there but everyone had an excuse wayne wanted to stay home to spend quality time with his kids tim was grinding down in florida and didn't want to leave his money on the table and lance said that he would go but he tells me i'm on the bubble in the 600 dollars main event at the reserve so i can't talk right now if you know anything about the reserve they actually live stream all their events on facebook or youtube let's see how he's doing it's been a tough there he is table here for lance all right go get him lance Dude, Lance could win this whole thing. I've seen him do it. All three of them have aces. Now a king. They check it down. It's uh, been a tough uh -oh. feature table here for Lance. Here at the reserve, and that is going to be it for Lance. He Whoops. is eliminated. Well, he's not on the bubble anymore. Well, oh, hey, Lance, how about now? You want to go to Cleveland? Screw it. If no one wants to be in my award-winning poker vlog, then I'll just go by myself. Solo mission. Five or six shots rang out right outside this Greyhound terminal between two men threaten each other saying once they get to Detroit they will call their friends to fight each other. That's right, I bought a Greyhound ticket. I can't remember the last time I took a bus anywhere. There was an exchange of gunfire between three separate vehicles. I was steady ducking because them bullets don't have a name on them and I didn't want to catch one of them. When Kayla dropped me off at the station in Detroit, I expected a depressing hellhole of broken spirits and grime-covered piss stains. The place needs an overhaul. Greyhound sold to a company called Flix Mobility, then sold off many of its inner-city bus stations to a hedge fund. The stations are now closing and getting repurposed. Fucking bitch. But the station was in surprisingly good shape. Sure, I didn't want to touch anything with my bare hands or talk to anybody there. But that's not so different from the airport. But the bus was pretty sweet. We departed and arrived on time. The three hour ride only cost 25 bucks. The seats were pretty clean and comfy. And the best part was I overheard two upstanding gentlemen shamelessly exchanging tips about buying mail order brides. This is the worst. Stop it. Get some help. Stop it. These guys really had things figured out. Unfortunately, those two alpha males were on a different route. 
As I boarded my bus, I faintly heard one guy ask, how do you stop him from stealing all your stuff after the divorce? And with that, I was on my way to Cleveland. I don't know why people badmouth the bus so much. A two hour delay in Detroit, 12 hours after she got here. She called Greyhound and all they would say is the weather's to blame. The ride was very convenient. In a few short hours, I took a nap, watched a movie, and I reviewed my poker notes. All the passengers on the bus were very respectful and kept to themselves. I was really impressed with the whole ride from start to finish. But nothing could have prepared me for the horror I saw when we arrived at the Cleveland bus station. The Cleveland bus station was foul, wretched, grimy, vile, derelict. This station was an absolute disaster. Everything was filthy. The lights were on, but it felt like I was walking through a malevolent fog. It was a ghost town. No staff anywhere to be seen. There were desks that were clearly designed for ticket agents tickets or security guards, but they were all broken and vacant, except for the one that was occupied by the ghost of a former drug addict. The amount of filth kicked onto the floor made me so worried about picking up a disease that I carried my suitcase instead of rolling it. To add to my anxiety, I noticed more than one person sleeping on the filthy floor with raid cans littered around all over the place. The Derelict! Oh my god. When I went to use that dripping wet restroom, I felt like I was in a war zone. Everything was broken. Every toilet was clogged. I was terrified that a tricycle riding clown puppet with a rusty knife would force me to solve riddles before ending my existence. This atrocity is the city's most horrifying secret. Cleveland, you can do better. Anyway, I got the hell out of that disgusting bus station and started hoofing it to my hotel. Luckily, I made it to the Comfort Inn unscathed. So. I made it okay. I gotta show you the video of the bathroom at the bus station in Cleveland. It is one of the most atrocious sites I've ever seen. Absolutely oh, so you, vile. You took a video, you said? Oh, I had my spy glasses after all. Oh, oh my god. Alright, well, I gotta go to the casino for a couple hours. See ya. Love you. Fucking bitch. We're about to go to the casino. After I checked in and calmed myself down a bit, I walked down the street towards the casino. This area was much nicer. The fresh evening air and the delicious aromas from the restaurants woke me up again. And in no time, I arrived at the Jack. I really like the poker room here. The seats are really comfortable, the tables are roomy, and they have decent food you can order on your phone, which is a massive benefit for tournament players. And since I had nothing else to do for the night, I bought into the 5-5 PLO game for 500 bucks and sat down to play. All right, it's Thursday night. We're playing 5-5 PLO. We're in for 500 bucks. At this point, we've played for about two hours and we finally wake up with a playable hand. Since the button straddled for 10 and I'm in early position with aces, I just call because I know someone's going to raise it up and then I can pot after. The hijack raises to 50 and he gets a caller. When it comes around to me, I pot for 220. Both players begrudgingly call. Son of a bitch. The flop runs out ace, eight, five, all diamonds. I flop the set, but I'm vulnerable. Either way, the pot's too big. I'm not going anywhere. And since I'm first to act, I go all in for my last last 140. Both players end up folding and I take the $800 pot down undisputed. At this point I'm up 320 bucks on the night and that's more than enough money to play the satellite tomorrow morning and hopefully I can win a seat into the $1100 main event. So I cashed out and went back to the hotel for some rest. That's why they call me part time. I have a bad habit of waking up at 6 a.m. every day, thanks to my day job. By 7 a.m. Friday morning, I was already showered, dressed, and regretting my choice to eat the free hotel breakfast. But I still had three hours to kill before the 10 a.m. satellite at the casino. To keep myself distracted and out of the casino, I played Spider-Man on my Steam Deck. I'll play for two hours and then head to the casino to play the 10 a.m. satellite. I skipped the 10 a.m. game because satellites are not as fun as Spider-Man. I just need to leave in about 30 minutes to start the real tournament on time. God damn. Shit. 
God damn it, I gotta go. On the way to the casino, I stopped by this saloon to try their mac and cheese. Alright, I gotta go with mac and cheese here. Thank you. I tried the mac. It, it was, uh, fine. Good. I left that place. That mac and cheese was ass. It was dog shit. I don't care what I say in the video. That was one of the worst mac and cheeses I've ever had. And I arrived at the casino just in time to buy in and sit down. It's the first hand of the tournament, and I'm lucky enough to be in the big blind. Not only do we get pocket nines on the first hand, but Big Bucky over here raises it to 700. Half the players at the table weren't even seated yet, and we've already got Big Bucky here trying to establish himself as the table bully. I mean, there's always somebody that tries this shit, and at least this time I have a defendable hand. So I call the 700 and flop an open-ended straight draw. <laughs> oh yeah, baby, let's do it. I check because I want to see what Big Bucky is going to do. He bets 1100, and I call. The turn doesn't help anybody, but he still takes a stab at it for 2200. I call again. The river is a blank. I check once more hoping he's gonna bet, but he checks and when I table my nines, he mucks. I don't know what he had, probably a strong ace. That's a great first hand. Exactly one orbit later, I'm back in the big blind with pocket nines again. Three players make the call before it gets to me and I raise it up to 700. Big Bucky sees an opportunity to win some of his chips back, so he's the only one that cals. The board runs out king, queen, seven. I bet 1100 to see if he's got any of it and he folds. A few hands later, we're under the gun with jack king suited and we raise it up to 800. Two players call and we have position. The flop is everything I wanted to see except for of course a pair but i have the nut flush draw i have the straight draw i have everything except for a hand both players check to me and i raise 1200 they both fold and i take down a nice pot i'm in middle position with pocket kings we're still at 100 200 in the first blind level i raise it up to 700 and get two callers the flop comes queen high so i bet 1600 and both players fold we're on the button with ace two offsuit. So far I've been hitting a lot of hands, so I'm gonna lean into it. And when it folds around to me, I raise to 1100. Big Bucky never really wants to fold to me, so he calls. Even though we've played a lot of hands already so far, I have a hard time reading this guy. He never showed any emotion. He just sat there, motionless, unblinking, and only breathing through his mouth. Lose a big hand, blank stare. Win a big hand, blank stare. The waitress laughed at your dumb joke, Blank stare. He is a formidable opponent. We check it down all the way to the river, and he mucks when I show that I caught a two. I should have made him show his hand first, and that was my own mistake. But at least we win another pot. Blinds are now 200, 400. I'm under the gun with pocket aces. I just call the 400 because I'm hoping that someone's going to raise pre-flop and I would raise again. Really heavy, really harsh. Unfortunately for me, nobody raises, but the button and the small blind all call. There's four players to the flop. And here we go. We flop a set of aces. After both blinds check to me, I consider raising, but I decide to check, hoping I can trap the button into betting first. Unfortunately, he checks and we get a queen on the turn. Now it gets interesting when the small blind tries to take a stab at it for 800. Again, I consider raising but I just call hoping to keep the button in the hand the button calls the 800 and we get a blank on the river the small blind decides to double barrel it for 900 and I raise to 4100 both the button and small blind fold blinds are 200 400 I've got King Jack suited in the big blind the dude wearing tweed who hasn't played a single hand raises 2200 I call and everyone else folds the flop comes Jack high giving me top pair I want to see what tweed's gonna do so I check and I was a bit surprised when he checks back the five of spades comes on the turn I bet 3200 and he folds easy money we're still at 200, 400. I'm on the button with pocket queens. After one more caller, the hijack raises the 900. Big Bucky and I both call, so we got three players on the flop. Both players check to me on the jack high dry board, so I bet 1600. The hijack calls and we see a turn. The second jack on the turn is a little bit concerning, but I feel better when the hijack checks it to me. I check back and we see a three on the river. Hijack checks again. I wasn't really sure if I should bet here. If he has a jack, he's probably gonna check and try and get me to bet. But if he's got a strong ace with no pair, he's not gonna call a bet so I just check and it turns out I won 
Big Bucky's at it again, coming after my chips. He raises to 1100. I've got pocket sixes in the small blind. It folds around to me. I call and so does the big blind. The flop is a nice and wet jack high board. All three of us check, we see a free turn. What a perfect scare card, the seven of clubs. That's three clubs on the board and it makes an easy straight. Once again, everybody checks and we get a blank on the river. Nobody wants to take a stab at it. It checks all around. I take the pot down with my pair of sixes. Easy money. I've got 5-3 suited in late position and 300-600 blinds. A lot of people have been folding to me, so I wanted to try some aggression and see if I could take a pot down. I bump it up to 1,500. Big Bucky and Tweed oh. both call the 1,500. We got three players to the flop. Interestingly enough, I flopped two diamonds and, well, bought a bear. I double barrel for 2,500. Big Bucky snap calls. Tweed gets out of there because oh. he's weak. The second king comes on the turn, I make it 6200, and Big Bucky doesn't even hesitate, he gets it in there. At this point, the bet size I was going to have to make after the river is going to be too much just in case he's got a king. So unfortunately, I checked the Big Bucky, and he tables his pocket tens. But if I would have put another bet out there on the river, he would have folded, I'm sure of it. Blinds are 400, 800. We've got a 25k stack. We're on the button with pocket aces. After under the gun calls to 800, the hijack raises to 1700. I three bet to 4000. Maybe it was a bit too aggressive, but sometimes when you slow play aces, somebody sneaks in the pot with 7 8 offsuit. And bam, 8 king 8 on the flop. The hijack checks to me, and I bet 7000. He folds. We take down another medium pot. Small pot. A few hands later, I'm in the big blind with pocket queens. I know it's probably just coincidence, but I swear every time I'm in the blind, Big Bucky tries to take it. He raises to 1700. I'm the only caller, so it's heads up to the flop. The board runs out 833. After I check, Big Bucky bets 1100 to try and take the pot down. I call. I give a nervous check, hoping to fool this guy, but he's played with me before. He knows I got something. He checks back to me. I check to him on the river, hoping that he's gonna bet, but unfortunately, he checks. I show my queens, and he mucks. I think he's only one that one hand off of me the entire time. Blinds are 500, 1,000. I'm in middle position with pocket fours. I'm the only caller until it gets to the button. Old man coffee. He makes mm. a standard raise up to 2,500. Mm. Tweed and I both call. I like calling here because there's more mm. than one person in the pot and I close the action. When I flop a four, I'm ecstatic. Unfortunately, if I had to guess old man coffee's uh. range, it's kings, aces, ace, king, something like that. So the right move is to either let him catch up or let him hang himself. So I check the flop and sadly, he checks back. Back, so we see a free turn. The two doesn't help anyone because I doubt this guy has ace five. So again, I decide to check, hoping I can get him to bet. OMC checks, so we get a free river. The king makes things interesting. I bet 3,000 and OMC calls. When I table my hand, OMC admits that he would have folded it to any bet on any street except for the river. So I guess I played it right. I've been getting a lot of good hands and I've been winning a lot, but they're all small pots and all it takes is for one small mistake before I'm out and I'm back at the hotel playing more Spider-Man. So I don't care if I'm winning small pots as long as I'm winning pots. Blinds are 1,500. We're almost at the dinner break and we've been card dead for a while. My stack has been dwindling down and I've got a pathetic 20,000 chips. That's 12 and a half big blinds if you're following along. I'm not in good shape, but I have enough chips to make some moves and I still have fold equity. I moved to a different table about a half hour ago, but people are dropping like flies. So I have a read on most everyone at the table, except for the new girl who sat down in the middle of the last hand with a fresh 30,000 stack. This means that she just lost and rebought just now. Usually if you rebuy this late in the game, you're already going to be on tilt and you're at a huge disadvantage. So it's important to note when people sit down this late with a fresh 30k stack. I do have to pick my spot carefully because one seat to my left is Frank, right, the big wait. stack at the table. I expect that if he has any sort of hand, he'll call my all in without any hesitation. So I'm waiting for a banger of a hand so I can jam. That's when I look down at ace queen suited on the button. When it gets to the new girl, she raises mm -hmm. all in for 30,000. This really does put me in a tough spot because yeah, it's not impossible that she has ace king, aces, kings, queens, but she could also have something crappy like ace 10, king, queen, just garbage, but she's on tilt. So she's playing aggressively trying to steal these blinds, trying to get people to fold, trying to win only heads up. And since this is literally her first hand, I don't have a read on how she's playing, except I have to expect that she's playing like uh -huh. somebody who's on tilt who had to just rebuy. I usually like to be the aggressor in this situation because if I call right here, there is no possibility that I can take down this pot without winning a flip. I take a minute to really think about how many people might actually call this hand. Frank was in the small blind. Anyway, I started blasting. The other <laughs> player didn't raise, but he just called. So I'm thinking he has a mediocre hand, maybe suited connectors or something. So with those two assumptions, I'm guessing that with the new girl jamming all in and me calling the all in, I assume the other two players are going to fold. So I put my tournament at risk and I call the all in. I need to win this flip, otherwise I'm back playing Spider-Man in the hotel. Tragically, I Frank instantly calls and my stomach sinks a little bit thinking I'm going to have to win a three-way flip. 
And that's when the new player announces, fuck it, and puts his chips in the middle. So this is either the worst thing that could possibly happen to me, or I'm about to quadruple up on this. Everyone exposes their hand before the flop comes out, and I have the second best hand. The big right, chip wait. stack has the best hand with pocket kings. The new girl has ace jack suited, so I've got her crushed, and the other player has some garbage jack 10 offsuit. So if I can spike an ace or find some spades, I'll end this pot with over 80,000, which would be huge. The flop comes out 10, 6, 4, with only one spade. The jack on the turn, uh, it gives the worst hand, two pair, and it gives the new girl a better hand than mine. I need to hit a king and only a king to win this pot, or I'm back at the hotel. And let's go to the river. We hit a, a queen. So once again, the worst hand won. Museum map on my phone. Our project's in a special exhibit on the top floor. Can't wait to see our names on the little sign, like real scientists. Today, Oscorp Science Center. Tomorrow, every major museum in the world. I have a bad habit of waking up at 6 a.m. thanks to my day job. By 7 a.m., I wished I'd stayed in bed and skipped that rancid breakfast. Again. Ugh. <laughs> I had three hours to kill before the 10 a.m. satellite, so I played Celeste on my Steam Deck. Okay, I skipped the 10 a.m. game because satellites are not as fun as Celeste. I'll just leave in 30 minutes to make it to the tournament on time. God damn it. All right, I gotta go. It's Saturday, day 1C. Blinds are 100, 200. I'm under the gun too with pocket jacks. The cowboy <clears throat> to my right raises to 600. I flat call and OMC comes <clears throat> along for the ride. Hubba hubba, we flop top set. And it's a connected board too, so we might get some big action on this hand. Cowboy C bets <clears throat> for a thousand, and I call, hoping to entice OMC to stick around. <sighs> the eight of clubs on the turn gives me a little pause, but even if Cowboy has a straight right now, I can still pair the board and hit a boat, which is definitely gonna get me paid huge. After Cowboy checks, I have to bet here. I put 3,000 in the pot, and unfortunately he folds. <clears throat> I would assume I got max value out of that. 200, 400 blinds. I'm under the gun with eight, nine suited. I haven't played too many hands so far, so I figured my 1200 raise right here will broadcast that I have a very strong and powerful hand. <sighs> OMC to my left has played even less hands than me, so when he snap called, I got a little worried. But lucky for me, suited connectors are easy to throw away. Unless, of course, you flop an open-ended straight draw with backdoor diamonds. You know, then you could get in trouble. I bet 1800 to see where I'm at. OMC snap calls, and the other player folds. The turn doesn't help me much with the queen of clubs, so I decide to check and see what OMC's gonna do. I was not thrilled when he bets 3200, but I decided to call anyway. I don't know, maybe I can hit like a 5 or a 10 on the river. Oh my god, I f***ing hit a 10! Oh, f*** yes, f*** yes, f*** yes, f*** yes, f*** yes. I figure if I check, he's probably gonna bet, and then I can jam over the top. And if he calls, I get a nice sweet double up. So I check, and he does exactly that. He bets 6,000. I pretend to think about it for a second before picking up my coat and saying, oh man, I guess it's probably about time to go home. And I put all my chips in the pot, and I'm like, I'm all in. OMC certainly speaks that language. He knows exactly what that means. He lets out a sigh. He's upset. He knows that he's lost, but he can't help himself. And he calls. He flips over his aces, and I flip over my straight. So we get a nice double up. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you play suited connectors. We're at 500, 1,000 blinds. I've been card dead. It sucks. So of course, I raise the first ace-king suited that I get, hoping to get some action, and sure enough, the big stack at the table, he comes back for a 10K raise. This guy has been playing like a loose cannon, three betting and four betting often, and getting away with it, and it sucks because I usually don't have anything to clap back at him with. Finally, I do. I call the 10K, hoping to spike an ace or a king or some clubs or something to put some pressure back on this guy, and... And six eight four <laughs> flop all red i don't know what gto says at this point let me know in the comments what i should have done here before i finished the hand but i had a bad feeling i mean this guy's been hitting his hands like crazy and super aggressive <laughs> along with it that's why he's the big stack at the table i was scared i didn't have anything i'm like this guy's at least got a pair i checked and he bets seven thousand no i was out of there he was upset he didn't get action when he flopped the set <laughs> 
A few hands later, I'm under the gun with pocket tens. I call the 1,000, and the guy in the gray sweater to my left goes all in for 11,900. He sat down about 20 minutes earlier with a fresh 30k stack, which means he rebought. He's only played one hand before this, and it was like ace queen offsuit or something like that. Because of how short his chip stack was, and because it folded around to me, I closed the action. I decided to call. We're gonna go heads up to the flop. He shows aces. Fuck. Nothing comes to help me. Well, that just means we're playing one street poker and we've got to win a hand. Otherwise, we're going to be back at the hotel before dinner break playing Celeste. We're at 600, 1200, and I've got ace 10 offsuit in the big blind. That's less than 10 bigs, so it's not great. I would much rather be under the gun right here so I could be the first to jam, but I have such a few amount of chips that I'm going to have to get this in no matter what. Across the table, PJ calls, and this old lady raises to 3000, which the way she's been playing, like that's just, that's like a normal raise when you really don't have that strong of a hand, but you want to try and take these blinds down. It really does suck because her chip stack is large enough where she's probably going to call me, unless she was just trying to take take this down and then she'll let it go but i doubt she's going to regardless i still think i have a better hand and i go all in and to my joy the old lady sighs she calls and flips over ace nine ah. fuck yeah there we go how about some luck that's what i needed i needed a double up shit i needed a couple more double ups all right let's go to the flop all right i have her absolutely dominated this is basically a guaranteed win all right let's go to the board oh fuck ah. Thank you. I busted out, man, some bullshit. Fucking bitch. Sometimes I hate this fucking game. Not Celeste, though. Celeste is magical, peaceful, frustrating, but rewarding. Celeste is it's the type of game that's tough but fair. I certainly would recommend it. It's a really fun game, real creative, an interesting story. You can play it in one weekend in between bus trips, especially when your bus is running late. Well, I didn't win the tournament. I didn't even get close, but I don't want this trip to be for nothing. So I had to get a little creative to count this as a win. While I sat in my hotel Saturday night, playing Celeste, eating greasy ass noodles and waiting for my 4 a.m. bus ride home, I downloaded TurboTax and filed my taxes. And then BAM, EV tax credit. $7,500 rebate. I mean, that's a $7,500 win. Also, I won that one PLO hand Thursday night. I mean, that, that probably counts too. Oh, and, and the vending machine in the hotel totally malfunctioned and emptied out about $20 worth of change when I was up there buying Reese's Pieces. And that absolutely happened. I don't have video of it malfunctioning, but look at this. It just wouldn't stop dumping out quarters and nickels and dimes. It was hilarious. <laughs> Let's do the poker math. We had $25 bus ticket, $350 hotel, an $1,100 main event ticket for day 1B, another $1,100 ticket for Saturday. Then we won $320 in PLO, $7,500 with the EV tax rebate. We won $20 in the vending machine. We had another $25 bus ticket home, but then we got a $25 refund on the bus ticket home because it was eight hours late. Oh! That's right, I had to wait in that godforsaken hellhole of a bus station for eight hours. I am never taking the bus again. All right, adding it all up, total profit on the trip is $5,245. That's definitely a win. I'm counting it. Task two is complete. Only eight more to go, and I'll finally be a full-time poker pro. Thanks for watching. Here, did you see this video? It's pretty good. This one is pretty good.